Test two, test, test one, two. I hear you. Check. <laughs> hot mic, hot mic. Enjoying this nice weather, Chief? Uh, it beats standing out in front of the school at minus 10 with a you betcha. 20, which I've done. Yeah. I more see. times than I care to. <laughs> How's your dog doing, by the way? Oh, she's fine. She's fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually over in Portland right now with my dad. He's having a procedure done, so he'll be fine. It's just, uh, you know. Tell him I said hi and get I well will. soon. Will do. Yeah, I look like I'm in the witness protection program here because my face is sort of like hidden in the shadows of the light from the window <laughs> here. So my very dramatic, here. Yeah, very dramatic <laughs> <Yeah>. footage. <laughs> hi, Will. And hi, Jen, I see that you're on as well. Hi there. Is it beautiful there too? Yes, it is very nice um, out. Nice. Very nice day. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Dick. And hi, Susan. Okay, that's better. John has not joined us yet, Dick. Okay. Well, he's got a couple minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, Julie, I see that you joined. Hello. Hi, John. Hello. Hello. Hi. John here. John Thanks. Allen. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Happy Tuesday, sunny Tuesday. Oh, beautiful out here. Heck. Uh, you might have to wake me up in the middle of the meeting if I fall asleep. You hear me snoring. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Might have to mute. You. Might have to mute you. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, my atomic clock says it is three thirty. So I'm going to open the March twenty third, two thousand twenty one selectmen's meeting. And the first thing on their agenda is a call to order. Will John and Barbara are both here, I'm here. And then we need to approve the minutes of our previous meeting. And, and I do have a uh, correction. Let's see, uh, the correction would be that uh, Susan and David Mason were in attendance at the uh, last meeting. Uh, Susan's name is Susan, not Sue. And she and her husband were there. So I think those should be entered into the minutes. I will make a motion to approve the minutes as corrected. I will second that. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. All right, our next item is an extended uh, liquor license oh, for Wentworth and the Eagle. Um, how do we feel about, uh, are we being premature by opening up uh, more liquor serving venues than they have now? Should we wait until uh, we hear more from the state or are we prepared to go ahead and give that authorization at this point? I'm, I'm in favor of extending the requests. John, what do you I, think? I, I think, you know, hopefully, you know, I said everybody being vaccinated and stuff, we should be in good shape. So I, I'm in favor of uh, yeah. Extending it. Now, when Barbara, when you say extending it, uh, approving the, the approving system. the extension. <laughs> Correct. Approving the extension. Okay. And John, you're I in agree. favor of 
of approving the extension. Absolutely. All right. Then let's have a motion on the. Uh, maybe we better take them one at a time. Uh, what do I have? I've got the eagle on top of my list. So I make a motion to. Oh, sorry. Right. Right. I make a motion to approve the uh, request to um, extend their liquid license for this summer. I assume it's the summer, right? And I will second. And I will second. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Uh, then we have a discussion with the. I'm getting feedback. I don't know if somebody's. John, I think it actually might be your phone. Are you on a speakerphone? Yes, I am. Now, right, it, well, I believe it's gone now. So, okay. Is John still there? Mm -hmm. I am. All right. Uh, Chief Pearlie would like to speak. Um, hold on, I'll make a motion. We're, oh, would yeah. you want to speak on the uh, Wentworth? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't do uh, Wentworth. Right. All right. I'll, okay. I'll make a motion to extend the liquor license or to approve the extended liquor license for the Wentworth. And I will second that. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Ah, now we get Chief Pearlie. Chief, go right ahead. Um, I'm proposing a, uh, a new policy for the police department. Uh, the policy is entitled fitness cost reimbursement. Uh, the, uh, uh, I've circulated a copy of the proposed policy to all the selectmen. Uh, and the purpose of it is to provide financial assistance for fitness related expenses to full-time officers of the Jackson Police Department required to pass the police standards and training fitness test. Uh, there's a couple of reasons uh, that I have for suggesting this um, policy. One is to continue to encourage uh, fitness and healthy living for the officers. That's a benefit that pays dividends both for the community uh, and for public safety as well as the officers uh, themselves. Uh, they have a legal obligation to pass the fitness test uh, every three years, and if they don't, uh, they can run the risk of losing their certification. So we do have a vested interest in them maintaining their fitness. Uh, and it is also a very common ancillary benefit uh, in just about every police department in Carroll County and the majority of police departments in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, for example, uh, the Conway Police Department pays an entire uh, fitness um, uh, fitness club membership benefit, which is they're up around $1,000 uh, locally uh, for a year. Uh, they pay it in, in total. I'm not suggesting that we do that, but I am suggesting that we uh, that we do uh, s start to incorporate this type of benefit into the officer's benefit package. This currently would only affect two officers. Uh, ultimately, it'll affect the entire department as there is turnover myself and Staff Sergeant Boothby and Officer Sherry are not obligated to take the test because we were certified prior to that uh, ruling. But eventually the department's gonna be full of officers or trying to uh, hire officers. Um, and uh, it, like I said, it's a very common benefit uh, and we gotta keep up with the times. So in, uh, in short, what the policy would do, if you're a full-time police officer uh, and that you were, uh, you have personal expenses associated with uh, maintaining your fitness at or in excess of the minimum standards set by police standards and training, uh, then you could be uh, reimbursed. Again, it's a reimbursement. It's not a bonus or an additional wage of up to $500 per year for a fitness center or gym membership and up to $250 of matching uh, reimbursement for fitness equipment to maintain their equipment. Some people might be more comfortable working out at home uh, or they need some additional equipment to work out at the gym, weight belts or what have you. Um, so, and, uh, so they would have to, the conditions would be, they have to be a member, you know, they have to join a gym. It's not just money in your pocket to go spend on anything. 
Uh, and if they, they do have that membership uh, up to $500. So if they, if the gym membership was less, I know uh, officer Bork currently belongs to a CrossFit gym and it's around a thousand dollars a year. So this would really only subsidize it by about 50%. Uh, so if they have a gym membership, it'd be reimbursed of up to $500. And then if they had uh, fitness equipment up to $250 would be the cap. And again, it would be a matching expense. So if they only paid a hundred dollars for whatever piece of equipment they might need or, or desire, uh, then it would be a hundred dollar matching reimbursement with a cap of 250. Um, the caveat is they have to provide receipts. It's paid in the last pay, pe pay period of the calendar year. Uh, so it's not like they would, you know, join a gym and then quit, I guess. Uh, there'd be no incentive for them to do that. Uh, and if the, the officer is obligated to take the fitness test and fails, reimbursement will cease until uh, they uh, pass the test. So it's, it's motivated reimbursement uh, for their extra effort to maintain that level of fitness. Uh, the, the funds I'd like to draw it out of is the Mark Hammer Trust. There's $10,000 in that trust. Um, at current staffing levels, uh, we would have at a maximum reimbursement, we'd have six and a half years of funds before you'd ever even have to raise $1 uh, in the operating budget uh, for reimbursement. Uh, like I said, this is a very common benefit uh, in almost all of the agencies in the county. Uh, I'm starting to see what really got me thinking about it. One is that uh, Marty Bork joined a CrossFit gym and he was really excited about it. Uh, and the other is uh, I've seen ads in the paper for Carroll County agencies, and that's one of the benefits they're listing. And um, we, uh, I don't want to get behind the times and I don't want to lose good officers uh, to other agencies that might have, you know, a couple more bells and whistles. I, and I want to encourage them to maintain fitness, both for their wellness and for the protection of the community. So I'm asking that you approve the policy as written. Uh, and the funds will be drawn from uh, the Mark Hammer uh, Trust Fund. Chief, I have a question. Uh, would you consider a 50-50 matching situation? I, my brother-in-law ran uh, gyms out in Ohio. He was a physical fitness freak. And <laughs> the big thing was, uh, you know, to sell <clears throat> subscriptions and the percentage of people that did not follow through was high. I mean, that's what he was there for, was to smile and get them in the door and sell them a prescription. Uh, was, you know. Anyway, uh, by doing 50-50, you get their, uh, their part of it in there. And, and I think it's more of an incentive to follow through. On all of it, you know, if they buy a pair of skis to, you know, do cross country skiing um, to help with their uh, cardio fitness, I think it's great. And, you know, I wouldn't want to buy the skis and then, you know, well, I never really got around to it. So if they had a financial interest in it, I, I think it would be a great incentive. Yeah, that's why, Dick, that's why the policy I wrote that if it's equipment that they're going to use for personal or in-home training, it's a matching up to 250. So that means they have to expend some expense in order to get the reimbursement of up to 250. Because I considered that. It's like, I, I don't want people to just buy home gym equipment just because they can. They have to have some skin in the game. The only thing about the uh, matching participation for gym membership is it may exceed the $500 and I want to kind of put a manageable cap on it to start because we don't have this policy right now because uh, as I said Marty Bork when I asked him he said he pays about $1,000 a year so if that you know over time we've got a fund that'll pay it for six and a half years you know if that goes up to 1200 and the language is matching 600 you know the language is matching funds then you'll get some bracket creep on the policy versus a fixed 500. Um, but the, I just want to make clear the equipment participation is matching. The gym membership was five, but most are going to cost you more than 
way more than 500 and close to a thousand. So it's pretty close to matching, but whatever language it makes you more comfortable. Well, if you state the $500 max and then say, you know, 50, 50 max matching on equipment and for a gym membership, it would be uh, matching up to $500. So yeah. I, I think we can put the words together that uh, keep that incentive in place. <clears throat> yeah. Without yeah, letting yeah. you know, run wild. It's not, you know, it's all of a sudden. Yeah, because you, you, know you want to be able to anticipate what the cost is going to be, even if it is coming from that trust, you know, so you can manage mm -hmm. it effectively. Uh -huh. yeah. I guess I'd like to make a couple of comments. I feel like as I think it is a great benefit that other towns do get to pay that. I just feel like if someone is joining a police uh, force that they should have some incentive to stay in physical shape as a part of their job and what they're doing. I, I'm not really in favor of, of reimbursing this. However, the fact that we have a trust that we can use versus using taxpayer funds, I'm not opposed to it. However, when that trust runs out, then it will have to be added to the budget. So I'm really, I, I see where you're going is wanting to be able to keep and attract the, um, the, the best officers, but I'm, I'm just thinking that that should be part of their job. Um, I take other um, considerations like licensure for an accountant, for example, and there are certain things that are paid, but there are certain things that aren't paid because it's expected that I would maintain certain parts of my licensure or education. So it's definitely an agreed upon uh, term. So uh, I guess that's where I am. And yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I don't think that absent the policy, there would be no incentive to maintain fitness because as you said, Everybody gets in this line of work, knows they have to maintain a level of fitness for their own personal survival, if, if need be, and also to help others. They also have, they already have an incentive to maintain fitness because if they fail the PT test over a number of attempts over a period of time, they'll lose their certification. It's yeah, and really I think you would have a problem with that, having someone that is not <laughs> maintaining their... Fitness. You'd lose your job. I mean, yeah. you'd lose your certification. It's really, um, so it's not like the absence of the policy, there's no incentive to stay fit. Mm -hmm. uh, really to make, to keep a, a employable package that is consistent with the market that, uh, that we compete with. Now you mentioned being a CPA, um, you know, Granted that you, you have to do certain things to maintain your license, but at the same time, there are places that would employ a CPA that would say, oh, by the way, if you want to come work for us, we'll pay for your Series 7 renewal or we'll pay for that, those continuing financial education units that you have to have to maintain. So it's not, it's not out of the realm of the workplace so right but that's I, what I'm, I'm saying it's it can go both ways i just I, yeah. I do feel like we have a very um we pay our our employees very well um so i know sarah wants to comment as well okay can i come in before that yep. uh, i i would like to give it a try uh with the chief's idea of using the trust fund that he already has that money we can revisit uh, funding that in the future uh, when it becomes necessary, or if the police can do fundraising for that, uh, I would see it. So, but uh, I certainly hear what you're saying, Barbara, about um, that, that is part of the job. I mean, if um, you're totally a donut eater, uh, I don't think that you can hold up. Uh, well, you know, that's the joke, but uh, it, you, you wouldn't really be able to hold up to uh, the stresses of the job. Sure. So that is true. The way, that is true. Um, I, I think it's a good idea, but uh, I'm sure I'm listening to everyone. So 
Uh, Sarah, like you would like to speak to this? Oh, John, did you have something? Yeah, briefly, if I could, before yep. Sarah jumped in. Absolutely. Um, uh, just to, you know, the, I, I like the idea, Dick, of maybe doing it on a trial basis, uh, maybe a year or two to see how it goes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly would be in favor of something like that. The only thing I'm a little concerned with is the equipment out of pocket stuff. What would be considered, you know, proper training equipment? I mean, would it be something like um, a pair of downhill skis? Now, I skied the other day and I, you know, I worked pretty hard at it because I'm old, but and it certainly did help my fitness a little bit, but it isn't a, it isn't a program. And I just worry about things, items that would be purchased that may not actually be program oriented equipment at versus, um, I don't know, I guess casual recreational use. You know, I just want to make sure the equipment is indeed going to the right source. I, I think the chief can make a pretty good, uh, judgment on that i i don't think he's going to be buying uh softballs for the police department so that they can play in the softball league as a fitness exactly. program so um i i think he'd have a good uh take on what would be appropriate for equipment and what would not be yeah and i'd like to speak to that john i, I gave that uh that subject some the very same thought. And that's why it throughout the policy, the proposed policy, I use the term fitness equipment, not recreational fitness equipment. Um, I don't want to be approving apparel. And I, you know, I think in application, that's where I just make it clear to the staff. It's like, look, if you know, at the end of the year, you, if you have receipts for this equipment, it's going to be equipment like, for instance, a, a weight bench, a barbell dumbbells, a weight belt, um, whatever, you know, they might buy a treadmill and a treadmill is going to cost you thousands of dollars, but I, you, they could be reimbursed up to $250. dollars not going to pay for it. But I completely agree that it wouldn't be for a, a power, fitness apparel because I don't think we should be buying sneakers. I don't think it should be for recreational equipment per se, like you said, like you know, a tennis racket or downhill skis, um, you know, you, you can be involved, but you know, I, if an officer made, uh, you know, a big play for it, I got this piece of equipment, uh, and I'm using it in this fitness program, uh, and they're maintaining a level of fitness. It's arguable. I, I think it's, I think it's clear enough. It's not a, you know, it's not a slush fund and it's not to buy sneakers and, and, you know, track suits, I guess, if, if you want to, for lack of a better term. Um, and it's not for recreational equipment, it's for fitness equipment. Okay, John? Yep. All right, Sarah? Yes. Uh, number one, I'd like to say I would appreciate it if this idea, rather than be voted on today, be tabled and brought to the meeting in May. Uh, to put before the people just to at the end of the meeting to see how they feel, number one. And number two, I'm thinking that I get material from our health benefit uh, trust and they have programs in the health trust to uh, and counselors to help you and give you uh, different things to help keep you healthy and in shape. So I think we're already paying for that through our our health insurance program, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Well, we, 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 we as the town of Jackson are not doing anything that the, the uh, Primex would or the, the health trust, but not every officer ha necessarily has insurance through the town. They could have insurance uh, th themselves. So they wouldn't benefit from that if they didn't have the insurance. This would be a direct benefit to them uh, as a policy of the police department. Okay, I think that was a good discussion. Um, I would like to take the vote now. So, uh, John, would you make a, a motion? 
Mr. I'll make a motion to approve the policy uh, brought forth by the Chief Curley today. Can I second the motion with a note that we're doing it on a trial basis and we'll revisit it a year from now? I think that's acceptable. I have no problem with that. Okay, that's a motion and seconded. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Thank you very much, all of you. And uh, I get, we'll revisit in a year. And Barbara, did you have some ideas on what it is, what kind of benchmarks you're looking for in that year to see, are you looking at like cost and those kind of things? Yeah, mostly cost and, and benefit. And, and I guess I'd like to compare what benefits are in other towns and what our entire benefit package includes and salary comparisons, that kind of thing. Okay. All right, I'll make sure I have that information for you. Thank you. All right, terrific, thank just, you very uh, much. Just, oh, just and a quick addition that, uh, you know, just a note that, you know, people who are listening that town funds are not being used for this first year. Correct. No, that's correct. That is correct. And it's just a one-year trial, I guess. Right. And Chief, do you want to stay on for the Iron Mountain Road uh, conversation? Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. I think that would be applicable. All right, that's the, the next agenda item is a discussion of uh, waivers for um, Iron Mountain Road property owners. And uh, I guess I could read these in the, uh, the waivers will be available on the website or to anybody that wanted to review one in the office. I'm going to read the permission for uh, OHRV use to property owner on Iron Mountain Road. And I ask that this be for an individual. This is not for a house, for a household, for a couple each individual has to have this permission. That way, if somebody rents their house, whoever comes in does not have permission to use the snow machine on this class six road because I don't want any of those properties to become uh, snow machine destinations. In other words, they haul them in on a trailer and start going up and down the road. So. Uh, on whatever date the Board of Selectmen considered a request by whatever property owner of Iron Mountain Road, Jackson, to operate an OHRV on Iron Mountain Road. The Select Board granted the request. The property owner is permitted to use the uh, vehicle on Iron, Iron Mountain Road at his or her own risk, agrees the town of Jackson is not liable or responsible for any injury or damage that results from uh, use of this road for an OHRV. This permission is granted for as long as the property owner owns the property located at. And the, uh, the other part of this is a waiver for the plowing, the maintenance on the road, which we are going to allow to a certain extent. And uh, I had a pretty good conversation with uh, Carrie Burkett. Burkett, I'm sorry, uh, who thought that one of the problems was people in the spring seeing this road flattened out by snow machines that they were gonna drive up it. And I guess last year, they one vehicle went up there, got bogged down, came, the owner came out, got a tow truck, the tow truck went up and got bogged down. 
really tore up the road. That's what's going to, I think, affect us as a town, us, uh, the most is the deterioration of the road. So in order to save that, I suggest that we put in a bar gate, not locked, but class six roads are subject to gates and bars. Uh, so that if anything came up and they had to go through, but a sign on the bar gate that said, you know, for the springtime, no vehicle use, no, I don't know, motor vehicle use or what the wording would be exactly, but don't drive up there, Yahoo. Um, <laughs> you're just gonna cause trouble and the gate is across. It, yes, it can be removed, hopefully by only a property owner that needed to do something, a trailer, a, a snow machine out for maintenance or, or whatever. But anyway, she thought that the gate would be the way to go because people drive by a sign uh, and never, never even look at it. So I, I think that in time we ought to... Uh, get a gate set up with a bar and a sign that says, you know, you can't go up there. And then once it's passable in the spring, uh, we just take the bar away and that sign would go away. So then it would resort to being a class six road again, open to uh, the public. How does that sound? That's great, may I comment? That's Jen Mello. Yeah. I'm going to go through our, you know, John and uh, you, Barbara, and the chief, and then I will listen to everybody else. I promise. So I just want to clarify that we have two actual things that we're addressing here. One is a waiver for the plowing, and the second is a written permission for OHRV use. So there would be two different um, pieces of paper or whatever processes that each one would have to go through. Is that correct? Uh, so the waiver would be for the, yeah. the waiver would be for the property owners and residents and the OHRVs for, would be the separate ones for each person. Yes. Okay. I think that sounds very reasonable. I do like the gate idea, but I definitely want to hear from the residents that live there to see, like you said, after we all comment, but I think that that's important to see if they feel like that would work. I, I hope it would. I hope it would deter people from going up that road and getting stuck. Okay, John? I feel the same way. I, you know, I think it sounds like a good solution to this. Hopefully, we'll hear from people who actually live there and see what they think. Okay, uh, Chief, do you think this sounds like a, a workable situation? Uh, yes, I do, Dick. I mean, certainly um, a road subject to gates and bars sends a pretty clear message about vehicle traffic. Um, I would kind of um, just remind everybody that we, we had a pretty effective uh, ordinance applied to Prospect Farm and Black Mountain Road that did make it an offense to use uh, a vehicle unless you were a property owner uh, on those roads after a certain date. I don't know if that would help as well. Um, uh, uh, we have that rule that says you can't drive on those roads in a vehicle, you know, subject to a penalty after, uh, I think it's, it's consistent with the parking ban. It's after like November 15th and until the road ban is lifted. That might help. Um, uh, but also too is, um, I'm, I'm glad that we're addressing it. We did have a vehicle up there that was stuck. Uh, we did have to coordinate some recovery efforts um, uh, to get it out of there uh, because it does pose a public safety problem if this vehicle's stuck on the roadway. Uh, in addition, I was up there today actually, um, and I noticed I checked on the snowmobiles. There's a couple that are there. Uh, two of them were in compliance with the registration rule one was not, I'm not familiar with whose it is. It was a blue uh, Articat Bearcat 570. Uh, it is not registered in the state of New Hampshire. I left a note uh, on my business card saying it does have to register. So hopefully that person will abide by that 
uh, gentle reminder. But um, if you know, we, we have had a lot of changes up there. Uh, and if people are going to use their snowmobiles with permission on that road, they do have to comply with the registration requirements for snowmobiles in the state of New Hampshire. Um, but I, I would agree, you know, it, with plowing the road, it's like an instant invitation. And the person that got stuck was people were following a GPS, going to a hiking trail. Uh, but, you know, people don't always use their common sense when they're on vacation. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, good idea, Dick, I think. Okay, it's a good thing we don't have a covered bridge up there. <laughs> or a golf course. Let's not build one. Or a golf course. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now uh, I would love to hear from uh, Jen? any property owners. Sure. Um, so thank you so much for the solution. Um, we're thrilled. And I, I personally will speak for myself about the gate. I think it's a great idea. Um, my, my one question would be, um, can we consider everybody um, in terms of who needs to access the upper um, Iron Mountain Road in the winter, um, where the, the gate in proximity, we would put that. So um, just, to, and we need a, we obviously need a home to park. Um, so we, we wouldn't want the, the gate to be someplace where uh, we would not have a place to to park our cars. Um, and then what we do normally is just hop on the snowmobile and um, take our provisions up and then literally use the snowmobile to come back out and that's it. I mean, that that I'm speaking for my husband and I and how we work. Um, we're only there part-time, we're not there full-time. So I know that it's a different um, lifestyle for those that are there full-time. Um, but I am in favor of the gate, I think, um, if we could get something on the gate that just says, you know, I don't know, Iron Mountain residents only, um, but I don't know if that's, um, you know, I don't ne necessarily know if that's the right thing to do. I mean, I think the issue that I have personally is if we're all, we as residents are paying to plow and we plow up to a portion when, where there's a gate and then the gate beyond the gate is only access for us. Um, basically, people who are either cross country skiing with um, Jackson Cross Country and accessing the trails through Hall Trail or hikers or snowshoers are accessing only because we are plowing for them. So if we didn't pay to plow, nobody would be able to park there, including us. You know, it's kind of like a catch-22. Um, you know, I certainly don't want to prevent people from enjoying Jackson. It's just um, I personally see it as a safety issue. That's that's my input, my, my opinion. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other property owners? Um, David, David, and Susan Mason are on, and they have said that they agree with the placement of the gate. Did you want to comment or you guys are good? They're good. Oh, go ahead. Susan wants to comment. Hi. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for um, getting these waivers together. I appreciate it. And we are looking forward to next season to be able to plow. I, I did have a conversation with Carrie yesterday and um, I'm also in agreement about the placement of the, um, the gate, which is sort of right near the forest service road as it is now um so thank you yeah and also i'd like to make a comment about the fact that um unh has a um a parking lot um i don't know if you guys are aware of that yeah so i guess um i'm showing up late to the meeting i just got out of work but um it it seems like they've been allowed to have a parking area and I guess um, just kind of curious about what the placement of the gate would be um, from that point of the, the UNH parking lot. So you're saying at the end of the forest road? Uh, that's what I've heard so far. Okay. From the people I've talked with, but yep. uh, you know, again, I'm, I think parking is one of the issues that we're going to 
have to deal with for quite a while because I don't think that, uh, I don't think having the parking is inviting more people in. I think the people are coming in anyway. Right. And having parking, I think is alleviating a problem. So I, I don't think it's inviting people, but I think it's dealing with the, the situation that we have. So parking yep. will be, uh, you know, a major consideration as we go along. But this yeah, is certainly a step to try to, you know, uh, try to smooth this thing out and make it workable for the, you know, I'm, I'm focused on the property owners. Yes, it's fine to have the skiers have yep. access to the fall trail and whatever, but I'm mostly interested in having it workable for the property owners. Well, thank you very much. And, and I know, um, you know, being up there for six years now that I have pulled multiple cross country skiers <laughs> out of the ditch with my Jeep. Um, and we've gone through a, um, a few different plowing scenarios over the past four years where they stopped at the Martin house one year and then they stopped at UNH the following year. But unfortunately, there are a lot of cross country skiers that utilize the haul trail and their vehicles aren't adequate to, um, to get them up and down safely. And like I've said, I've, I have at least three or four occasions where I've chained up and pulled people out of um, a snowbank. And uh, I, yeah, I agree that it's, it's kind of a different situation with a parking spot for cross country and, and homeowners that live on, on Iron Mountain. So, um, you know, thank you for giving us that. Okay, and then uh, Sarah, did you want to uh, weigh in on some part of this? Yes, thank you. I don't live up on Iron Mountain. I live on Green Hill Road. And I would just like to say to my neighbors and also to the fact that they're telling you about the cars and vehicles that go up and down Green Hill Road. And right now our speed limit is 35 miles an hour. And I'm saying to you, I've been to everybody I can think of about getting our speed limit down to 25. Uh, being a person that has neighbors in the little hamlet as you come to the top of the hill, walking their dogs, having their grandchildren, and myself, it is a very dangerous situation when people come down from the top of Iron Mountain and Green Hill at a high rate of speed around the corner. So again, I'd like to put my two cents worth in on that note and uh, say that it is a very, very busy road. <laughs> and it needs to be addressed as well as the parking on top of Iron Mountain. As you know, due to the COVID-19, we are having a lot more visitors to our area. And as uh, my neighbors just stated, they are uh, seeing more people parking up there. Well, again, those same people go up over the hill and they come down the hill at a very high rate of speed. And I would like my selectmen and my police chief to try to uh, have this road posted at 25 miles an hour, similar to what it is on Thornhill and over, at least the last time I was on it, there was still a sign for 25 miles an hour on Sugar Hill Lane. Thank you. And I've been here for, you know, well over 50 years. So thank you for your time. All right, um, I'd like to uh, have a vote on accepting the two documents that have been created for us, uh, the permission for the OHRV use and the uh, plowing. I'll make a motion to approve the plowing waiver as presented. I'll second. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. And the uh, snow machine use, or no, it's permission it's, to permission to operate an OBR. OBR. Right. I will make a motion to approve the permission form for OBRH use. And I will second that. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. 
John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Love these meetings. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, read that. I do have to make a quick comment. I do agree with Sarah, though. I think at 25 miles an hour would be a nice postage up there. I, you know, it it is on Thornhill, and it, I don't see one here on Sugar Hill Lane. But you know, those dead end streets, you know, I think uh, you know might be something to consider. It's not going to stop people from speeding, obviously, but it at least has some teeth to put into people, remind people that there is a slow area. I agree. Uh, excuse me, Barb. Yes. Um, I just want to remind the board that last summer we had a plan coordinated with New Hampshire Highway mm -hmm. and actually um, one of the state reps, uh, I, I can't think of her name's escaping me right now. And we were going to put up a, um, a device to do a traffic study. Uh, but that, that got sidelined because of COVID. Right. So that was in the works for last year to do a speed study on uh, on Green Hill Road. Uh, hopefully we'll be, uh, Anita Burroughs, that's what it was. Hopefully we'll be able to revisit that this year if things open back up to get some definitive data on that to see if the 25 mile an hour uh, limit or any change in the limit uh, would be appropriate. I just want to remind everybody, that's how you have to change speed limits is by a traffic study or an engineering study in New Hampshire. Thank you, Chief. And Sarah would like to comment again. Wait a minute. Hold on. What? Okay. Okay. Is it something new or is it the same? No, it's something new, Dick. Uh, the oh, other yeah. thing I wanted to add in was uh, also to don't forget during the normal season, during the winter, uh, along with this traffic study that I heard heard about a couple of years ago, but at any rate, the cross country skiers at the bottom of the hill, that turn also is a very dangerous situation when people are coming down the hill at high rate of speed. So when the traffic study is done, I think that that also should be part of it because depending on what time of year they do it, they they're you know that is one of their busiest trails is the Dana Place Trail and there are hundreds of people on a good weekend there can be thousands that go by so again thank you for your time. Okay. Well, now I would like to oh. Uh, is Linda Terry there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Um, would you like to speak to thanking uh, Denise for her work at the library and that she is moving on now, but uh, certainly not forgotten? Yes, I'd be, be happy to, to do that. Um, much to our dismay, Denise Sachs has decided to resign her position on the library board of trustees, which, uh, which had included her position as chair. Um, and um, we're going to miss her very much. She's been a great contributor to all of the um, um, events and um, uh, policies of the library. And um, we will be um, looking to uh, fill her elected slot until the time of the town elections in May. Uh, Helen Wasco, who is going to be running to fill that slot in May, has agreed uh, to, to step in to uh, Denise's vacant slot subject to your approval. We, we also have two alternate positions. Is it all right if I mention that? At this point? Sure. Sure. Okay. We, we have two vacant alternate uh, positions uh, at the moment. Um, and we recommend the appointment of Elizabeth Hughes and Laurel Smith to fill, uh, fill two vacant positions. Uh, Quinn Nichols, uh, who had currently filled an alternate slot, will be finishing up her position the end of this month. And at, at that point in time, her position will also be available 
we, we've had a great deal of interest uh, in those alternate positions and we hope to be able to fill the third spot at some time in the near future. Thank you. Okay, so should we take a vote on uh, having Helen Wasco? There's no study on Vaughn Hill. The cramp said- Terry, Terry, you're not on mute, excuse me. Sorry, Dick, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I think, do we need to take a vote on that or can the library just uh, make that appointment to fill out the position until March, but I mean, I'm fine with the idea that if we should- The, the RSAs require board of selectmen approval okay. to fill right. the open slot and, and for the alternate spots. That's clarification that I needed. So I'll make a I, I, I'll make a motion to approve Helen Wasco as the new library trustee. And I'll second that. Okay, John seconded. it. Uh, Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. And could I just have clarification of her last name spelling for the minutes? Bennett, uh, yeah. it, yes, it's spelled W-A-S-C-O. I thought so, just wanted to make sure. Thank you mm -hmm. so much, Linda. Thank you for checking. And just a point of order, do we have to officially accept Denise's resignation or just that's a foregone foregone conclusion. I, I certainly would accept her resignation. I guess we should do that. Why don't we vote on that too, just to be safe. All right, I make a motion to accept with regrets, uh, Denise Sachs's resignation from the Board of Library Trustees. And I'll second. Okay, John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Uh, should we vote on the alternate positions? Yep. I will make a motion to accept the, uh, or to accept Elizabeth Hughes as an alternate on the library trustee, as a library trustee. I will second that. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. And then Laurel Smith. Go for it, John. I'll make a uh, motion to uh, accept Laurel Smith as an alternate to the Board of uh, Library Trustees. And I will second. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. And thanks for all you that you all do. It's nice to have um, volunteers and uh, alternates at the waiting. Yes, it what? is. We, we very what? much appreciate their services. And please be sure to make an appointment to visit the library. Yes. Well, we're very fortunate to have the library and the people that run it in this town. It's a very dynamic place. And uh, certainly uh, I'm amazed at how it's constantly, it has energy, it has its own energy. And it's the people in there that, that do that. So I hope everybody takes advantage of it. Thank you. All right, then the other board appointments that we have are uh, planning board. We have uh, Chris McAleer, a regular member, three year position, and Huntley Allen, an alternative, uh, alternative member, no, an alternate member with a three year position. I would take uh, motions to accept these candidates. I will make a, a motion to accept Chris McAleer and I'm sorry, I missed the other one. Huntley. Oh, Huntley Allen. <laughs> Huntley. Yeah, sorry about that, Huntley. I'll uh, second those. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. 
I think we've got them. Uh, it's Chris McAleer and Huntley Allen. Uh, John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Okay, the uh, Conservation Commission, we have Tom Seidel for a three-year position, Brian Byrne for a three-year position. I'll make a motion to accept Brian Byrne and Tom Seidel for the Conserv Conservation Commission. I will second that. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Uh, the Zoning Board of Adjustment. We have Huntley Allen for a regular member, a three-year position as a regular member. And well, we haven't got a letter from Dave Metesky, so I think we'll have to hold on that. But I will take a uh, motion on Huntley Allen as a regular member of the ZBA. I will make that motion. And I will second. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. Yes. There's also on the ZBA, there are two alternate member positions available. Yeah, I think I covered them. All right, board of, oh, now we would have a, uh, is Emily Benson there? You know, she's not, but she and I spoke yesterday and uh, we decided not to make any changes to the policy for the town at this time, um, based on the fact that there are a lot of people getting vaccinated. So we'll hold off on making any changes. Um, however, we do realize that as people are becoming vaccinated and they've passed their 14 days after the second vaccine, that um, they, they are still encouraged to mask because they can still carry, there's not enough data to know if they can still carry COVID and spread it to people that haven't been vaccinated. So again, we're not changing the policy at this time. We're just asking that people still be diligent and respectful of those that are not vaccinated yet until further, you know, until it's further down the road. Excellent. Well, I don't want anybody to get too cocky about yeah. this just yet. Right. Let's, let's get on top of it. All right, thank you, Barbara. Um, I have one more thing to add to the uh, discussion today that isn't on the agenda. And that's, we had started um, a discussion of transfer station chits for the uh, short-term renters or the short-term rental operators to have to give to their um, clients so that they would have a one-time pass to use the transfer station. That still allows the operator, if they want to pay a service to take care of the trash, they can do that. Um, if they want to take care of it themselves, they can do that. And we don't have to keep fighting with the uh, renters up there or the operators who come in and say, you know, how, how do I tell my, what do I tell my renters they can do? You'll have a book of chits. Um, maybe you get 10 for $5. That's 50 cents a piece. I don't think that's an exorbitant uh, price. I don't know what it's going to cost us to print them, but I'd certain that was just a, off the top of my head. So uh, we want to cover the cost, but we're not trying to make money at it. But that would kind of, I think, alleviate a problem that we have up there. So, John, if you'd like to weigh in on that, I'd like to um, hear. I'm, you know, it's certainly a, a plausible idea that, again, the only you know thing that goes 
becomes a rub up there is the fact that they often don't recycle or don't know how to recycle, like I mentioned before, and it and that's that's where the the issue can be combative. Well, maybe that would help to have that printed on a chip, so the if the operator. Um, well, we uh, just inter we do we do hand out instructions with each transfer station sticker that a resident gets. So if we could hand out that same instruction with the coupon book and make that uh, owner responsible for that, uh, that was, you know, making sure that they educate their renters. But the other thing is we talked about this in the short in the um, short term rental committee too is that it is the responsibility of the short term rental owners to educate them coupon book or not. And um, and also, how many people are really required to take their own trash out? And it wasn't that many. Like there were most of them either had a dumpster between many of the units, or they um, they. The but this would help for the ones that. Okay, I mean, why don't we look into it a little further to see what printing would cost and then if there's a numbering system so that if a, a client goes up there with a chit has not recycled we can get the number off the chit and say to the owner the operator mm -hmm. hey you're sending people up here they're not recycling uh, there's going to be re repercussions educate your uh, renters mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. Well, we've discussed it, and that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, now we will go into uh, short term rentals. And I have. Okay. The first one is uh, Scola at 11 Hemlock. Hill Road. Uh, they have an approved three, three bedroom septic, um, three bedroom tax card, advertising three bedrooms, uh, sleeps, yeah, need to change their ad. Three bedrooms, even with the den, uh, you can sleep eight. So I think we will pass on that one. Is that all right? Yes. Sounds good. Okay, then uh, Catherine E. Sullivan, Wentworth Hall Avenue. Approved three bedroom, three, bed, three bedroom tax card, advertising three bedroom sleep safe. We'd be okay to approve this one. I'll make a motion to approve 9C Wentworth Hall for the Sullivans. I will second. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Okay, and then pending, we have uh, Nelson at Old Jackson Road, two bedroom building permit two bedroom septic on file. Uh, advertising was changed to two bedroom sleep six. Okay to approve. I'll make a motion to approve 28 Old Jackson Road for the Nelsons. I will second that. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. I thought you forgot about me. <laughs> no, I was writing. I can't do two things at once. I have to ask the vote, and I'm trying to write at the same time. So uh, my concentration will come back, I promise. Uh, Bennett votes yes. Thank you. Okay, and then we have uh, Wolf at uh, Georgia Lane, two-bedroom tax card. Uh, we're waiting for the owner to submit a building permit. Right, so we'll hold um, that one. 
I don't know if that's a building permit for windows. Georgia Lane is at Wentworth, isn't it? Yeah, that's for it, that is for egress windows. So we have not okay. received anything okay. on that. Well, when they get that rolling, we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, French at uh, 97A Dinsmore Road, no permit. A selectman must make a motion to send a violation notice. I'll make a motion to send a violation notice to the French's for lack of filing a conditional use permit. Oh, I will second that. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Then we have Solkowski on Spring Street, no permit, parking violation per Kevin Bennett, selectman must make a motion to send a violation notice. I make a motion to send a violation notice to, I'm sorry, I missed who it was there. Solkowski. Solkowski, thank you. And I'll second that. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. All right, then we have uh, the Horrigans. Um, there was a complaint there. Our building inspector has gone to DES to try to uh, continue the monitoring. There had been an oil spill up there and uh, there was some worry about the local water wells. So at this point, as long as the advertisement for the SDR meets the requirements of the SDR ordinance, uh, Mr. Allen's conversations with renters will not result in a violation notice. A letter from New Hampshire DES does not appear to set forth a violation or even require the Horrigans to do anything. However, the board will turn the New Hampshire DES letter over to the town building inspector, Kevin Bennett for his review and invite him to contact New Hampshire DES if he has concerns and report back to the board. And so Kevin, is, Kevin is on the call. Did you want to yes. comment, Kevin? All right. Um, yeah, sure. I, I called up Todd from uh, DES and he's, a head, he's head of the um, groundwater um, division there. And um, so that site is being monitored um, on a yearly basis, I believe. For some reason, they're, they're, they're going into a, uh, six months now. I don't know what that's all about, but um, he wasn't sure either. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, we're going to, um, we had a complaint, that, like I said, about the, um, uh, about the groundwater there from a neighbor. And anyway, we're gonna have his water tested and, um, Hopefully we'll just have that on a yearly basis too, just to um, give them peace of mind um, on the situation down there. And talking to um, Todd, and I've talked to the third party um, a couple times in the past about this site. And um, they feel right now that this, um, this oil spill is not migrating. It's, it's staying put, it's technically underneath the house. Um, it was cleaned up the best it could be back in um 1994 i believe it was um <clears throat> so anyway it's just it's they're monitoring it and if it if it starts to take off i guess other um other means will be um put in place to um, control it so i think at this time everything's kind of under control um and just continue monitoring the site when was the site originally tagged for this what, what the date uh, it was in 1994. The um, fuel tank in the uh, garage was filled up. Um, well, it was filled up once. It went empty within like uh, two weeks, and it was filled up again. And that's oh. when they. So then they started questioning, like, "Yeah, where's the fuel oil going?" <laughs> mm -hmm. So 
I, I do remember the call because the Jackson Fire Department was on scene for a couple of days there, um, helping with the cleanup for a while. <clears throat> was it a dirt floor garage? Uh, no, it was a uh, concrete and they had oil lines in the garage underneath the slab going into the back, um, back part of the house where the uh, oil furnace was. So between point A and point B, there was some kind of leak. Oh, I see. So it is all under the house. Yeah, it was all underneath the slab. Yep. Fun. Wow. Ventilated. It'll evaporate eventually. Yeah, they, they dug out some of it from the driveway, so they could they, they could get some of the soil out of there and some of the oil. But without without I mean digging out underneath the whole entire house, it's the best they could do at the time. Right. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, so now we have uh, building permits and driveway permits. Well, mostly building permits. Kevin, would you like to uh, speak to the building permits? Uh, sure. Yeah, it's just one. Um, it's one that's being just renewed, basically. Um, and they kind of they're kind of just getting started. Um, it was late in the season. They wanted to put footings in. And I said, well, the ground's frozen and you're not preparing the ground right. So I said, just wait till springtime. So anyway, they're going to just renew the uh, building permit and start when uh, road bands are off. Okay. And I think that's it for uh, building permits. Um, Dick, uh, yes? Victor Allen is on the call and would like to make a comment. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. You know, um, my, my issue was that I have a driveway, going, a rough driveway going in to build another house in the rear of that uh, location. And it's uh, not that far from that house. So I was worried about the well water mm. in the future. And I did have... They sent a state environmentalist up to my house um, March 10th to take a water sample. And um, yeah, I didn't get the results back yet, but um, according to him, that the contaminants can flow any which way or whatever way the land or the rock between the seams of the rock. Um, so I just have a you know, I'm worried about if I do, my daughter does build a house there, the well there is pretty close to that property and it could be contaminated. And I wasn't sure how much this town was involved in that situation. Well, I think you've heard from uh, yeah. the building inspector what he has done to try to uh, deal with the situation. Yeah. As the town, yes, we're trying to uh, accommodate the neighborhood. So yeah. uh, I think calling DES in was a really good thing to do. It gives us the uh, backup that we don't have the expertise for. Yeah. And but on the second page of the, um, the papers I sent in, it states that the the, 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 the state would re, reimburse the owner for the cleanup. That's correct. And I don't know if the town has any incentive to ask them to have it cleaned up because the state will pay for it. I think the state has done what they're going to do as far as the cleanup. And now they're monitoring, I believe they have monitor wells there. They do. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if they start seeing a migration that they will uh, take further action. Okay. Um, can I comment on the short-term rental there? You know, um, I, I don't think at this time that we're looking for comments on the uh, rental of the property, but uh, I suppose. 
if you'll keep it to a brief statement. Yeah, it's, it's brief. <laughs> Most of the, you know, they can have, it's a four bedroom septic and they can sleep 10. And most of the time there's more than 10. And a couple of weeks ago, I talked to the lady that was renting there and she said they, they came with 10 and they, the place was so big that they called up other people to come up. And there's usually more than 10 people there. And isn't six bedrooms on a four bedroom septic system um, permit a violation? I mean, they advertise four, but they have six. All right, I, I'm just gonna have to talk to our legal counsel as to what we can do as far as enforcement. And uh, I'm certainly not gonna make a comment on it at this time. Okay. I appreciate your time. All right, so buildings permits. Uh, oh, driveway permits. Um, I guess I, we still have a problem with one of the driveway permits, don't we? Like it's, they're asking for a permit, but not stating where the driveway is going to be. Kevin Bennett. Somebody better on. <laughs> I'm unmuted. We just comment on. It. I think there's a um, a driveway permit that was um, sent in, and it's a, it's got to do with up on Middle Mountain um, Road, I believe it is. Yes, and um, it was a five acre lot that was just recently sold, and um, uh, it's very steep, the whole entire lot. So technically. Um, you know, when someone puts a house septic and all the other stuff, driveway and everything else, and it needs to be engineered, I, I believe. And I didn't even get to that point. I think Pat looked at it and he didn't even really know where, same thing, where the driveway was going to go. Um, there's a site distance issue. If you go down the hill one way or if you go down the hill the other way. Um, so there's just a lot more information that the town needs. And this is one of these lots, like I said, it's going to have to be you know, they're going to have to hire a survey. It's going to have to be engineered, um, drawn out, um, just because of the uh, you know lay of the land. Um, it's very very steep. So I think we just denied it. Well, we didn't. Yeah, I, guess, I think we didn't deny it at this time, but we asked for more info. Okay, so have they put in for just the driveway permit, or have they? Yeah, just the driveway permit, permit. And, I, and I think it might have been, I don't even know if they purchased the uh, lot yet, but I think they were like looking for the driveway permit before they purchased it, and it doesn't work that way. Yeah. <laughs> no. So. And also, you're absolutely correct, that let's deal with this before we get into another situation that we've seen uh, up there with uh, all the the steep driveways and mm. you know let's try to start dealing with these ahead of time because all they do is come if we don't do it right now all they do is come back and bite us that's right bite you that's right <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh, well they've got me for a little while longer um all right I think that uh, I hope we'll hold on that driveway permit until we have further information. Uh, the upcoming meetings are Tuesday, April 13th at 3.30 via Zoom. Tuesday, April 17th, no, 27th at 3.30 via Zoom. Tuesday, May 11th, town meeting, uh, voting. And the location has been changed and we're back to the Whitney uh, from eight in the morning till seven in the evening. And we're hoping that we can do that as smoothly as we did the last election. Mm -hmm. uh, then Saturday, May 15th will be our town meeting deli deliberative session. And the location for that, we hope, is at the 
Whitney, and we're going to rent a tent. And I'm not sure what kind of a day we're going to look at, but we'll have a tent and uh, we'll have the Whitney. So hopefully town meeting will also go off smoothly. And after that, Tuesday, May 25th, will be another 3.30 Zoom meeting. First one of the new administration. All right, at this time, is there any other public comment? I don't have anything. Well then. John, are you sleeping? No, I'm right here. <laughs> All right. Watch you the people me. walk by. <laughs> Hi, people. <laughs> so I'll, make going out to <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn today's meeting. I will second that. Barbara, how do you vote? I vote yes. John, how do you vote? I vote yes. Bennett, yes. Thanks to everyone. Thank Have a good night. You too. Thank you.